Blood Ties is another nice arc episode that moves us closer to the season's towering finale. As a Born Again Dawn defender, I think the episode is a little underrated, based purely on my anecdotal impressions from the fandom. We're just past the season's centerline and still have a ways to go, but as per mutant enemy standards, there are plenty of wonderful little details here too easily overlooked. The episode opens with the gang planning Buffy's birthday party. Given how her previous birthdays have gone, Sunnydale had better have an emergency plan in place. Xander catches up any of us that forgot to set our DVR. We're going up against a god. An actual mightier-than-thou god. When the Scoobs suggest spending time figuring out who the key is, Buffy and Giles inform everyone that they already know. You know, and you didn't tell us? I'm a little ambivalent on this point, one way or another. I get the feeling left out, but I'm not sure there's a strategic argument that they know who the key is. They should be aware that Buffy and Giles know, so they don't waste their time. But the episode proves to be an argument for either why Buffy and Giles not telling them in the first place was a good idea, or why they should have started with Dawn. Meanwhile, the Knights of Potassium firm up their link as the religious symbol this season. Key is the link. The link must be severed. Such is the will of God. Really? Glory's minions show up for a fight, and I like to think this minion, executing the world's most unnecessary rope swing entrance, is named Sonny, saying we under his breath and thinks the other minions take their glory worship a little too seriously. Glory appears and brain sucks the survivors. Tara and Willow immediately prove Giles and Buffy right for not having told them about Dawn, promptly making things weird. Xander and Anya make it weirder. Uh, Xander needs help with his thing. I love that this is essentially the Anya version of half the jokes on Buffy anyway. Dawn makes a mental note of Giles' water journal, something nicely set up in Fool for Love. That night, Dawn gives Buffy a heartfelt present from before she existed, and everyone reacts with deep melancholy. The Scoobs are terrible at keeping secrets. Having had enough, Dawn breaks out to go get Giles' journal with Spike in tow. The two of them finally put the pieces together. The key is also susceptible to necromanced animal detection particularly those of canine or serpent construct. Wonder if Oz would have seen Dawn as a glowy green ball of light. Dawn takes the news of her keenness, uh, poorly. Buffy figures out Spike was with her, takes her anger out on him, and I actually love the way he sticks up for himself. It wouldn't be a season five episode without Dawn overhearing something she shouldn't. She hulks out, sets her journals on fire, and runs away. As the team searches, Xander Xander's things up a little. Would have killed, died for it. Summoned armies to control the key. You know, uh, she kind of has a crush on me. Okay, look, I get the way in which this line was supposed to be cute. Xander regularly feels insignificant, so having an ancient and powerful anything thinking he's neat is a nice boost to his ego. I'm just going to say it has aged poorly and weirdly. Leaving it at that, Dawn finds her way to the hospital to ask Glory's victims what she is. One of the knights sees her and confirms what Dawn fears. Ben finds her and Dawn lets slip that she's the key. Ben freaks out and turns into the femme goddess. The gang shows up and stalls until Willow teleports her someplace. Just Katie! I love the sound design for the magic spell, it's a cool moment, though in the realm of quibbles, and now that I'm thinking about it, why didn't they send her the same realm as Olaf, or some non-Earth dimension? Maybe that's a longer spell with a lot of gourd shaking or something. Magic gourd. Sorry. Magic gourd shaking or something. And the episode ends with Buffy reassuring Dawn that whatever came before, the two of them are connected. Blood Ties is a nice gentle plot episode, the most Dawn-centric since real me. As I've mentioned in previous videos, the more I've watched Buffy, the more Dawn has grown on me. On a show steeped so heavily in themes of identity and self-discovery, and in this season that represents the end of the adolescent allegory, Dawn's plight makes a certain sense. What am I? Do you know what a slayer is? Do you? I know there are Dawn detractors among us, but if anything, I've realized that whatever exhaustion I feel with her arc stems mostly from just how hard the plot has leaned on the tired cliche of having Dawn hover outside a room where the Scoobies are indelicately discussing her situation. I tried to make peace with it last episode, and her shirt here might be a subtle reminder of the Pink Panther reference from Checkpoint, but Hover Dawn happens twice in this episode alone. There has to have been a more clever way of building the tension over whether she was going to find out or not. More on Dawn in a minute, but at least after this one, everything is on the table. And this is still a solid episode with plenty of memorable moments. Sarah and Michelle's chemistry continues to be stellar. Glory is evil and powerful. 
and in no way prettier than me. As usual, at this point in the season, there's a lot we can't get into yet without spoiling, but there are tons of odds and ends to highlight that also, you know, might be relevant later on. Maybe. Spike is always a fun character to have lurking in any episode. I wasn't lurking. I was standing about. But with the exception of the sensational Fool for Love, it has felt like he hasn't had that much to do this season other than stand about looking so sexy. But things are about to change. Spike's arc raises a ton of interesting questions about the show, its lore, and its themes. The chip is not a soul. The chip is not a conscience, and he has proven his ability to go around it in episodes like The Yoko Factor and Out of My Mind. I've suggested that the soul acts as the moral compass, the conscience of the characters, and lacking one, vampires are incapable of altruism and real change. Altruism meaning acts of selflessness, which is distinct from kindness, which we have seen Spike exhibit towards towards Drusilla many times before. You shouldn't be walking around. You're weak. But Spike's actions as the series unfold may begin to challenge that interpretation of the canon, and we'll examine each action as they emerge. For example, what he did for Terra in Family. Spike could have hung in the background for the duration of that scene, but he chose to use the chip's demon detectorness, shocking himself in the process, exposing Mr. McClay's lie, and encouraging Terra to stick up for herself. This one is easy, but I still think it's important to look. Was that genuine altruism, a selfless act? Well, no. Probably not. Spike has a crush on Buffy, and it was an opportunity to save the day and embarrass an arrogant old man. But what about in this episode? Spike chooses to escort Dawn to the magic shop. whole number of beasties between it and And then, importantly, doesn't go out of his way to tell Buffy about his good deed. At least, not by the time she bursts into the crypt and rages at him. The decision to keep it to himself is unusual, given it's not like Spike has been subtle in his crush so far. You want credit for not feeding off bleeding disaster victims? Well, yeah. And later, he displays actual tenderness to Buffy when she's punishing herself for Dawn running away. She probably would have skipped off anyway, even if she never found out. She's not just a blob of energy, she's also a 14-year-old hormone bomb. He doesn't twist the knife, though again, kindness and affection are not impossible for vampires. There will be plenty more to discuss with Spike in the next episode. Tara seemed particularly horrified at the thought of what Glory does to her victims, what with the brain sucking and all. It struck me that the idea might not seem to her completely dissimilar to someone being misled and gaslit by an abuser. I couldn't help but think about what Mr. McClay might have done to her mother. These vampires just kill you. In the realm of shattered realities, though, there is nothing quite like what Dawn is going through. There is an adoption metaphor at play here with her finding out she wasn't born into the Summers family, but on top of that is the more significant information that until six months ago she simply wasn't. And Michelle's performance here, bearing the weight of that revelation, is outstanding. Dawn takes a lot of crap for... Get out! Get out! Get out! Even I've had some fun with it during our live streams, but I have two things to say about it. First, Michelle's performance evokes in me recollections of powerlessness when I was that age. Everyone is older, everyone has more say than you do, and sometimes your frustrations with the boundaries over which you have no control bubble over into moments of rage. That panicked freakout she has in the bedroom is probably not altogether dissimilar from moments of frustration and rage I experienced with my own family when I was her age, and I wasn't a glowy ball of green light with made-up memories and a hell god trying to, for all intents and purposes, kill me. Second, though, is it's a little baffling to me the hyper-emphasis on get out, get out, get out in the fandom while ignoring the crushing pain and intimacy of Dawn's moment from one second before. Granted, there's a second appearance of get out, get out, get out, but we'll jump off that bridge when we come to it. I love the final scene between Buffy and Dawn. The blood is a significant reference to the fact that Buffy and Dawn are linked, one of several linked pairs this season. The most obvious were the two halves of Xander, but Ben refers to his sister in this episode, presumably Glory, before he turns into her. Spike also made an accidental reference to Buffy and Dawn's connection earlier when he referred to Dawn as Little Red Riding Hood. But they'd really go for a Little Red Riding Hood like you. When Buffy was stripped of her powers and helpless, she wore a red cape, and Krolik spoke to her as the wolf. Why did you come to the dark of the woods? To bring all these sweets to Grandmother's house. On the surface of it, Buffy using blood to convince Dawn of anything might seem to fly in the face of the themes from the episode Family, where Team Terra rejected any importance of blood when it came to familial bonds. That scene is a precious one to me and speaks to the power of chosen family. But if you look carefully, Buffy has already made that same choice with Dawn. At the beginning of that same episode, she's explaining to Giles the revelation of who Dawn is and says, I have to take care of her. 
I want to. And at the end of Listening to Fear, Joyce and Buffy make that choice together. Then we have to take care of her. No matter what she is, she still feels like my daughter. As precious as you are to me. Again, there are layers to what Dawn is having to confront in this episode, family as well as her own physical reality. And I think it's the latter which explains the final moment between the two of them. Dawn's crisis isn't about family, but about her very nature. Am I real? Am I anything? And Buffy is saying to her exactly what she needs to hear in a moment of crisis. Dawn is. Yes, you are. It's Summer's blood. It's just like mine. She's doing so so that Dawn can make the same choice that Buffy and Joyce already have. Family over despair. If anything, I wish the episode had gone a little bit deeper into the theme of memory that the plot waves at. For her birthday, Dawn gives Buffy a picture of a memory that didn't actually happen, and the gang silently contemplates what that means. I remember. Later, Dawn burns up years of those journaled memories. Tara's memories of the family she grew up with were all real, even if some of them are memories of lies her father told her. But the point is that real or not, memory is still just a story. What matters is what Dawn, Buffy, Joyce, and the Scoobies choose to do with them today, right now. For the second time in two episodes, I was reminded of a scene from The Matrix. After learning what reality actually is, Neo re-enters The Matrix for the first time and doesn't know how to process the experience. He turns to Trinity and says, I have all these memories of my life. None of them are real. What does that mean? To which she responds that The Matrix cannot tell you who you are. 